Liberating Leadership Theory by Carolyn Kenny, reviewed by Carolyn Roberts. This is an inspiring book written by Indigenous women from across Canada, the United States, and New Zealand who have successfully challenged the mainstream education to secure the highest academic credentials institutions of higher learning can offer. They explore leadership con concepts that focus on building strong Aboriginal communities. The leadership that they demonstrate is not one of the educated or elected. It is a time-honored belief among Indigenous people that each person is born with innate strengths that can assist in the overall betterment of the community. The research in this publication encourages us to rethink leadership, to give thought to the original philosophies and practices of our Indigenous people, and to give a voice to these invisible leaders. This is the author, Carolyn Kenny. Carolyn Kenny is a professor of human development and Indigenous studies in the Act Antinosh University, PhD, in leadership change. She lives, lives in Santa Barbara, California, and Kenny's research focuses on the role of arts in the revitalization of Indigenous societies, music therapy, and policy issues related to Native women. As we move forward in Aboriginal education, it is important for us as Aboriginal leaders and scholars to know who we are and where we have come from, and to understand our traditional values, and to know how these values can help support and guide us in our journey to leadership. We need to build up our youth in a traditional way in order for them to feel connected and grounded so that they can continue the good work that needs to be done in order to help heal our communities and honor our ancestors and create a positive education for all of our future generation of Aboriginal students. This article was taken from this book, Living Indigenous Leadership. It is a part of a collection of academic texts that show the differences between leadership styles of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. Indigenous leadership and colonized leadership, they value different things. Therefore, it creates an unease on how we work together. Indigenous core values are not aligned with what leadership looks like in a colonized system. And what stands out the most for me in our academic research is the lack of scholarly work on how true Indigenous leadership is. Within these texts, it points to Indigenous women as being at the forefront of change politically, academically, and educationally in moving Indigenous leadership forward. And we can see that within our own cohort of 16 students, 15 of them are women. When reviewing the literature on leadership, there is very little that resonates with Aboriginal leadership for our new learners and educators to follow or even to connect with as we read and learn about leadership. Indigenous leadership style is built upon a complex system of connectedness to people, to the land, to the community, to our ancestors, and to our family. These stories within the text are given as examples of styles, and it's up to us to incorporate them to make our own leadership style. And there is not a one-size-fits-all for any kind of Indigenous leadership. The foundational themes or concepts that serve to ground Aboriginal communities are themes that are rarely mentioned in mainstream leadership studies. These concepts or themes are embodied. They are a premise on the idea that the parts of our being cannot be separated. We are whole. Our mental concepts are one with our bodies and our hearts and our minds and our souls. Also with our land and with our elders and with our stories. Our relationships, our friends, our culture, 
our collaboration, and also the healing and the resilience. These are concepts that unite our worlds, and the notion of embodied concept animates our leadership theories with the richness that keeps our worlds vital, integrated, and whole. So, how do we, as academics, indigenous academics, and leaders find relevant texts to draw from, to connect with, to inspire us as Indigenous people as we move forward in education. We, as Indigenous people, find ourselves always walking within these two worlds as we strive to become scholars and leaders within our communities and within our greater communities, is how this changing world is now becoming a global space, is making us not only walk in two worlds, but many worlds. Us being Indigenous leaders, we need to know both our own community and our values, as well as the Eurocentric society that we live in. Eurocentric leaders only need to know their society in order to operate. Indigenous leaders need to be holistic because Indigenous communities are small, and we value that interconnectedness. Eurocentric values are usually based on being separate, not a collective whole unit. Indigenous leaders belong to communal societies that must accommodate both tribal values and Eurocentric system in which Indigenous and non-Indigenous people have to coexist. But non-Indigenous people don't even have to think about us, don't even have to think about our culture or our society or our communities to be, a, to be leaders in theirs. So, at its core, Indigenous leadership is relational. The leadership stories in this volume explore a rich tapestry of themes and serve examples of exactly how to build strong Aboriginal communities. All of the contributors are Aboriginal women, and many other stories are about women. There needs to be more literature written about Aboriginal leadership how our communities are connected and how these communities define what a good leader is and means. As Indigenous scholars, we need to write more. We need to educate more about our traditional ways of leadership. Our future leaders need to know that there's works out there that they can connect with and learn from. If we have nothing at the post-secondary level for Indigenous people to connect with, then there's going to be less Indigenous people at the post-secondary level and higher education at all. So this is something that we need to build upon and we need to grow as Indigenous scholars. And these are great conversations for us to have because we need to create a strong Aboriginal leaders within our current education system so that our youth have somebody that they can look up to and follow. This will be how our communities and our next generations will have their voices heard. We need to connect with our traditional ways of being so that our youth have something to be grounded to, so that they have hope that the future will be brighter and they will be honored and they will be valued. The limits we have in this kind of text is the lack of Indigenous scholars to write more texts for our future generations. We need to educate, inspire, motivate our future generations to be proud of who they are and where they come from in order for that change in the system to happen. So we just need more Indigenous people to be scholarly and more scholarly works to be written so we have someone to follow. So the question that I always am left with when I read about Indigenous leadership and education is how we still only look at grades and test scores and dropout levels, push-out levels of our Aboriginal youth. We can see that this system that's in place, it doesn't support our children or our youth that we're working with, as you can see by the high numbers. So, what's, why are we still looking at what's wrong with our children? Why are we not saying, what's wrong with the system? Why does the system not support our Aboriginal youth? And what can we do to this system to make it better for our children? 
and to make it better for our communities and to make it better for the future. The road to indigenous leadership is filled with land, ancestors, elders, and story. These concepts are rarely mentioned in the mainstream literature about leadership. They are embodied concepts unique to Indigenous leadership. In, in the Indigenous world, there is a principle called the seven generation. It instructs us to reflect on our actions and to be aware of the consequences of these actions for gen seven generations to come. So let's put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children. The Halusa Nation, the human beings, the people, see the spiritual and the natural through sense and feeling. Everything is related. All the things of earth and in the sky have spirit. Everything is sacred. Confronted by the alien nation, the subjects and the citizens see the material religions through trauma and numb. Nothing is related. All the things of the earth and in the sky have energy to be exploited. Even themselves, mining their spirits into souls sold, into nothing is sacred, not even their self. The Ally Nation. <laughs> 